the recording. Again, welcome everybody uh, to episode 111 of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. I'm Jeff Letterman with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. I work in our Fish and Wildlife Division in the outreach section. I'm really excited to host this for you today. We're talking about the Minnesota fishing opener coming up this weekend. Uh, I actually grew up in Southern Minnesota and this year the opener is gonna be based out of Mankato for the governor. And um, we've got some of our experts here to talk about from the Southern part of the state in particular, some really great resources and ideas on fishing and catching walleyes in particular. So we'll get into that in a second, but I do want to mention this weekend is also take a mom fishing weekend. So uh, all you mothers out there, we hope you can get out and get fishing and join our challenge that we have, the Minnesota Moms Fishing Challenge. It's uh, going to be operated through a Facebook page, but um, I think Benji's going to throw up these those links if he hasn't already. So that you want to join, we're doing a little contest uh, for fun, but there will be prizes. Uh, for a uh, hundred or so people, we've got, I think, some shields, gift cards, and some uh, life preservers that are going to be given away. So it's a really fun way to share. All you have to do is take a picture of a fish or multiple fish, share that on the Facebook group, and you'll be entered into the competition. And we hope to catch 10,000 fish, or moms. We hope moms catch 10,000 fish this weekend. So it'll be really fun to see all those photos. So moms, get out there, or everyone else, take your mom out and try it. Sunday's supposed to be beautiful. What a great way to spend Mother's Day, huh? All right, let's jump into, uh, well, the Governor's Fishing Oper. Uh, coming up this weekend in Mankato, there's a lot of activities. Um, we've got a link that we can share with you about uh, what's available, but one of the things that the public can participate in is a tour of one of our hatcheries, and we have one of our uh, folks from the Waterville Hatchery here. Um, Brandon, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what's going on? It's Thursday, right? It is Thursday. Thursday 1 to 3. We have a bunch of stuff planned for people. Um, we've got displays of boats and trucks and some of the gear we use at the hatchery and stuff that we use out in the field. We'll have uh, a couple of hands-on things for the kids to look at fish and and turtles. Um, we'll be showing folks how we age fish and what we do with that age information. Of course, we're at the hatchery, so we'll have fish. We'll have everything from eggs. Uh, hopefully, if they don't hatch, the weather's been really nice and all our walleye eggs are hatching a little faster than we would have liked for the, for the open house. Uh, but we'll have eggs fry. We'll have small fish. We'll have adult fish. There's going to be a lot of stuff to see. We're expecting a lot of people um, hopefully the weather holds up and and uh, you know it's nice and sunny and not rainy. But there's there's a, we got a lot planned. We'll have some refreshments for folks. So uh, grab the family, come on out and uh, take a tour of the hatchery. Great. And this is Waterville, which is just east of Mankato, right? What's the address there? Just uh, the address. The city of Waterville. Oh, yeah, folks can find us at five zero three one seven Fish Hatchery Road in Waterville. Um, yeah, we're just. We're east of Mankato. We're about two miles west of the city of Waterville. Um, Google Maps will get you here. Yeah. Yep. South Great. side of Lake Tatanka. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then there are some music venues going on or um, uh, shows for, you know, bands. I guess those are all open in Mankato and in Madison Lake, which is where uh, a lot of the activities will be based at because they're uh, going to be fishing out in the Madison Lake area. A lot of the the folks that are coming down for the media and stuff. So check that out. Well, let's jump into actually catching some fish this weekend. And we're gonna start with the reports and just kind of a update on what's happening, especially in the Southern part of the state. So Scott's gonna start us off with um, what we're seeing in uh, the Hutchinson area, right? Yeah, that's right, Jeff. Thanks for uh, having us today. We're excited. Uh, everybody that's tuning in, you're hearing from five different uh, stations in southern Minnesota where we are quite proud of having some of the highest walleye gill net catches in the state. Uh, a lot of great walleye habitat down here, despite everyone's thought of having to drive north. We've got excellent fishing opportunities down here. So kicking things off for the Hutchinson management area, i um, going to give you some recommendations on some walleye lakes. Uh, if you see the I'm going to try to share a photo uh, while we're going here. We've had an undertaking of a, a large walleye tagging project on Lake Marion. Uh, we tag close to 1300 walleye in Lake Marion. And uh, those are just the sexually mature fish that are coming in uh, to spawn. Uh, that doesn't include the immature fish, many of which will make up anglers catch and are the ideal size for the frying pan. Maybe females that are in that uh, 14 to 17 inch range or some of those uh, smaller males. So a lot of fishing opportunities for folks that want to put one in the pan 
or if they want to catch some of those larger fish, Marion really is a great pick. Our last two gillnet assessments on Marion have been over 40 walleyes per gillnet lift. Other walleye lakes that we recommend in the Hutchinson area, uh, Washington, that whole chain, it hooks in with Stella and Manuela. Uh, that's a, a large windswept shallow lake that's full of spawning habitats, kind of nursery area for walleyes. We've got a lot uh, in Washington. Uh, <clears throat> Bell Lake uh, kicks out a number of fish, including many that are naturally reproduced. It's always a hot spot. We're always impressed with the fish numbers out there. Big Swan Lake, the uh, North Fork of the Crow River runs through uh, Big Swan, so it tends to take these bounces up and down, but it really has remarkable uh, walleye habitat with some points and rubble and uh, locations that you can find fish on. Uh, Minabel is another one, a little bit of an outlier. Minabel is a lake that really looks like it belongs in north central Minnesota. It's clear, it has a small watershed, it goes deep in a hurry, a lot of aquatic vegetation, but it actually has a pretty nice little uh, walleye population present in it. And then finally rounding out to uh, Alley and Preston in Renville County, a couple of lakes that we've got some turbid water that kick out some nice walleye catches there as well. Uh, another one to note uh, that was probably our top performer last year is Collinwood Lake. Uh, Collinwood Lake, we've got a good walleye population out there. Did suffer a partial winter kill. Uh, we're still assessing the impacts there, but my expectation is we should have plenty of walleyes left uh, for anglers. So. Get out, catch some walleyes. If you hit a few of those lakes, you may have a chance at catching a tagged walleye. And that'll be a great excuse to make some memories uh, out fishing with family or friends this weekend. I got to ask you, Scott, though, about that fish. That is a huge walleye. Do you know how big it is? Right. I took the picture down, but uh, we tagged fish on Marion up to 29 inches. We had a true 29 inch out there. We do see some 27s, 28s, and uh, really impressed by the number of females that were 20 to 24 inches. So we know we have quite a brood stock of egg laying uh, females out there to, to continue powering natural reproduction. Yeah, that's a trophy in anybody's book. We always think, as you said, of northern Minnesota, but there's some great fishing walleyes in particular in southern Minnesota too. So, all right, let's move over to BJ. He's in Ortonville and tell us a little about what's happening out in the western part of the state. Yeah, Ortonville, we're out on the western western border along the border of uh, South Dakota. If you're familiar with the outline of the state, we're on the bump. So that's that's where Ortonville is. Um, yeah, I'll start by talking about uh, we had some high water this spring. Um, a lot of snow, fast snow melt, uh, some you know, record or near record uh, flooding um, actually happened uh, in the area. But a lot of that has subsided now. Um, just looking at the lakes, driving around, seeing everything, uh, uh, there shouldn't be really any concern with high water. Um, fairly normal for this time of year, at least. Um, and we did have, a, did have a pretty late ice out as well. Um, on some of our bigger lakes, I think the end of April, April 29th, um, we saw ice cool out. So that's 10 days ago. Um, maybe water temps might lag a little bit from where they were last year at this time. But again, it's, I think it's going to be mid 80s today, pretty sunny. So uh, maybe we'll catch up with those water temperatures too um, pretty quick. Um, I do want to talk about winter kill though. Um, pretty fairly widespread in our area. Um, it did affect two of our more popular fishing lakes. Uh, Artichoke um, took a pretty hard kill. We had nets out there. Didn't catch a whole lot, unfortunately. Um, that was kind of developing a pretty good fishery. Um, I wouldn't put that on the top of your list um, this year, at least. We'll stock some fish in it. We'll stock some walleyes. We'll get it going again, stock some crappies and stuff. But um, um, for this year and maybe next, um, maybe maybe try some other lakes. East Toqua, though, also took a fairly hard winter kill. Very few fish in our netting this spring, but we have been working pretty hard at stocking a lot of walleyes in there from some of our rearing ponds. So I think at last count is well over 3,000 walleyes we, we put on East Tokwa. So for a 4,000 acre lake that, you know, hopefully hopefully that'll be a maybe a moderate fishery. It won't be what it was last fall or, or, or a year ago at this time, but um, there's some fish in there to catch. Um, but really most of our popular fisheries are Lacaparo, Big Stone and Travers Lakes, the bigger lakes. Um, some of our smaller lakes are like Hendricks, Dell Clark, Steep Bank, and Oliver Lake. And we have some good fishing in the rivers too, Fond du Terre River, Minnesota River. Um, I do want to mention too that um, out here on, on, on the border, 
uh, Big Stone, Travers, and um, Hendricks lakes are border water, so they're subject to different regulations. And starting in 2019, they've been open year round. So while we're kind of talking about um, while they open, are those those lakes have been open year round? But with the weather, um, laid ice out, um, there hasn't been a lot of fishing on them anyways. So it's kind of kind of fishing is just getting going on those lakes too. And as the water warms up, it'll start getting better. But you know, Big Stone has a great walleye fishery, um, um, pretty good average size. I think average size in our gillnets last year was about 19 inches. So um, um, Travers Lake, and these are big reservoirs too. Big Stone's about 12,000 acres. Travers is about 11,000 acres. Just Travers is a perennial, you know, great walleye hotspot. Um, spring fishing's pretty good. Um, just uh, very stable population for for a very long time. So Travers is a good spot. That's where I go to fish. So if I can catch a walleye on Travers, um, I, I bet you many of you could as well. Um, and then Hendricks Lake, it's it's a little small, like 1,500 acres. Walleye numbers have been fluctuating somewhat, um, but uh, I think we did have some pretty good year classes in there. So hopefully that should provide some some good fishing um, here in the future. And I'll mention lack of parl too. We had good numbers of smaller walleyes out there last year, 12 to 13 inches, and and as they grow here in the spring and summer, um, should be some pretty good fishing for you know those maybe. 14, 15, 16, even bigger fish, so. Great, lots of options. Yeah. Those folks that weren't able to join us last week, we had your colleague on talking about catching freshwater drum was a great talk. And your area in particular has got a lot of, a lot of great options out there. So if the walleye aren't biting, there's other options and check out the, the uh, recording that we have of that talk if you wanna learn more about our freshwater drum, really uh, interesting and, and, and tasty, I hear, species, so. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to uh, Tim Swanson in Spicer. Yeah, uh, so I'm Tim Swanson out of the Spicer region. Uh, Spicer's just south of St. Cloud and north of Wilmer. Um, we have a couple drastically different types of lakes in our area. Uh, south of Wilmer, we have these shallow, windswept, turbid lakes. And then uh, in the north part of Spicer, we have Green Lake and Coronas and a few other lakes that are you know, over 50, 60 feet deep. Uh, Green Lake and Coronas get to be over 100 feet deep. Uh, so two very drastically different types of lakes in our area, and they set up pretty different for the walleye opener. Um, we are looking forward to some pretty good bites on a couple of those shallow water lakes uh, early in the year, like usual. It's pretty normal for those to be hot spots during our, open, our uh, opener weekend. Um, however, we did have a little bit of winter kill on a few of those lakes this year. Um, one of our egg take, walleye egg take, spawn take lakes that we uh, normally would do, it has has had extremely good numbers of walleyes in the past, was Lake Elizabeth, and uh, that seems to have had a pretty hard winter kill on the walleye population, um, unfortunately. That would normally be a pretty hot lake for people to fish on opener. Um, so I don't necessarily recommend that one this year on the opener. Um, but we do have a fair number of other shallow lakes that are pretty good, on, should be pretty good on opener. Uh, Big Candy Ohio Lake has really good numbers of fish and a fair number of fish over 20 inches if you're looking for some big ones on top of your eaters. Um, Minnetonga Lake um, last year had extremely high numbers in the gill nets, um, pretty good numbers of eaters. And Ringo Lake, uh, another shallow windswept lake that has good numbers of those 13 to 18 inch fish for people to catch. Um, and then we've got a few of our deep lakes that are starting to warm up a little bit. Uh, Diamond Lake, one of our lakes that uh, has extremely good numbers of fish. And we do take eggs out there and we saw lots of fish between you know 22 and 28 inches out there for anglers to go catch on opener. Um, and then a few of our lakes down uh, south in the Cottonwood area um, also had some pretty good numbers. Cottonwood Lake, um, and then uh, a few of those lakes did happen to have some winter kill. Um, but another two lakes uh, that we tend to have really good uh, opener fishing would be uh, Cronus and Rice up in the Painesville area. Those two lakes uh, have extremely high numbers in our gill nets and 
we saw great populations when we were doing our walleye spawn take out there in the last couple weeks. Great. Thanks, Tim. It's really nice to have that diversity in your area so that if the weather's bad or, you know, I can go to a smaller lake or, you know, some of them are earlier productive. Um, that's nice to have that diversity. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. We are going to move to the southern part of the state, way down by the Iowa border with uh, Ryan and Wyndham. Yeah. So just some of you hit on it a little bit already. Um, we were blessed with some winter kill this year. <laughs> um, our area, you know, we've had anywhere from 20 some lakes of seeing some varying levels of partial winter kills in our area. But with that said, the biggies lakes that we typically see our walleye anglers targeting did fine. Um, even Lake Shatek, Lake, Lake Shatek is, we had windrows of, of dead carp and buffalo and catfish, and we were able to get do some sampling in uh, just recently this week, and and we still found walleyes, live walleyes in the gill net. So, um, I'm I'm sure they might have taken a hit in some little areas, but I think the the fishery as a whole will still be good on Lake Shatek. Um, as far as the winter kill, you know, uh, talking about the southwest part of the state or Wyndham area, I used to think Wyndham was named Wyndham because of the wind. Uh, that's not the case. Um, we are in the pothole prairie region and and basically when that glacier receded all these little depressions in the landscape are are what we would call our lakes now and so you know a, a typical lake in our area might be average of of 10 feet you know max and so these shallow lakes down in our area they're they're highly productive and um they can kick out some fish in a hurry and and within a couple of years you have 14 to 17 inch fish in in two growing seasons so um with a little bit of, of fry stocking maybe you get a, a year class or two of natural production boom you got uh, a recipe for really high catch rates of walleyes uh in our area so uh with that said uh you know Shatek uh in in 2022 during that survey, we had you know 34 walleys per gill net, so a good number of fish, and uh, several of those uh, fish are actually from natural production. So we're seeing good natural production in our area when we started looking at some of these year classes. Uh, of course, the uh, our main lake is Lake Sarah, which is where we do our our walleye egg take. That is our our, our basically our main walleye fishery from our area. Um, and and we do a walleye egg take there. And our survey in, in 2021 again had 38 walleys per gill net. So really a good, robust, abundant walleye population with consistent naturally production year after year after year. So um, it's just a, a really good fishery from a walleye standpoint. Um, Kansas Lake in Watanwan County, again, uh, just a little kind of a depressional lake, little puddle max of six feet deep maybe and but it had high numbers of walleyes last survey 53 walleys per gill net so um dead coon up in lincoln county again good numbers of fish um but again a lot of these are, are shallow lakes and so they are subject to a lot of the the stressors that come with either uh winter heavy winter um and potential of winter kill but also you know, if we get these big rain events, they can quickly swell and see big fluctuations in water. So anyway, um, there's lots of uh, lakes down in the Jackson County area. Loon Lake uh, has been really good catch rates lately, uh, 24 wallies per gill net. Round Lakes down by Worthington, again, uh, a consistent um, fishery for walleyes and somebody should actually consider that if they're looking for areas to go and and honestly okabina and worthington is is a really good fishery it's completely surrounded by the town of, of worthington and, and there's lots of opportunities for boat ramps and and places to put your boat in but the real benefit of okabina is lots of public shoreline that is available for anglers if they want to fish from shore um and which is a nice option so yeah, really good fishery in our area, um, and I think we, 
you know, other than a few little partial winter kills this year, uh, considering it was, you know, who knows, third snowiest winter on record, you know, we, we, we got by decent this year in terms of our lakes. You mentioned winter kill. Um, do you want to talk about a, a little bit you've touched on, but kind yeah. of the impact on the fishery and, and just even, you know, biology of that for the lakes and lake health? You want to mention yeah, that? yeah. So that, a lot of times people don't even understand what, what we're talking about when we're talking about winter kill. But um, I always like to use the analogy of, of, of your windows, essentially. And when you start uh, getting snow, as soon as that ice is formed on the lake, when you start getting snow, the, the blinds on your windows start getting closed so there's less light coming through. And and by the end of winter, when you have, you know, 20 inches of snow on the ice, your blinds are completely closed. There's no light coming through your window. And so when that ice forms, basically the only thing happening under that ice is oxygen consumption. And be that from fish, be that from decomposition of organic material or plant material. Uh, but basically, you're 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 basically have oxygen consumption and limited photosynthesis occurring, and therefore oxygen production happening because you have no light penetration getting to the water column and plant material and algae whatnot to to produce oxygen. So as the winter goes along, you know you start tapping into uh, stressors to the fish. Um, and so you have, um, two, two actions happening. You have a dosage, you know, what's your, how low does the oxygen get, but also you have the duration, how long has the oxygen been low? And so all of that comes together and, and basically creating stress for fish. Um, and again, species, depending on what species, um, you're talking about, they, they have varying levels of, of able to handle the lower dissolved oxygen during winter. Um, and so uh, just the quick and checks that we've done for winter kill checks in our area, you know, one, one of the things we've noticed, um, uh, channel catfish on Lake Tech. We didn't get any channel catfish following the winter kill checks. So they're, they're pretty susceptible to lower oxygen. Um, and so my guess is they're set back a ways. Um, freshwater drum in Long Lake in Watonwan County, that Long Lake experienced a little bit of a winter kill. That's another species that tends to not tolerate lower dissolved oxygen. Um, and, and even the crappies on Chitek took a little bit of a hit. So, um, yeah, it, it just it depends on uh, your fish community, how hard the oxygen got hit on a particular lake. So, And this is maybe a question for all of you, but do you you know, report or are there a way for ways for folks to find out, you know, which lakes have been winter killed? Yeah, so we've we've had some calls um, to our area um, and basically that's been the route that we talk. We, so that's so, the, yeah, that's well, the easiest way is for folks to call the area offices. And I see Benji posted the uh, we have a page actually on our website that lists all of our fisheries area offices across the whole state. So we sure. can you you guys are welcome to, or you you're, you welcome calls, right? Right. And another thing that we typically do on on uh, Saturday mornings, we have an outdoor show that we kind of report some of the findings that we do each each week in terms of winter kill and and what we're doing that week. So that's another avenue of, of getting that information from at least our area. So okay, thank you. Thanks for the update. Uh, we have uh, back to Brandon. He's going to talk more specifically. We touched on the opener, but uh, the Waterville area. <laughs> In, in fact, where where is the governor's party going to be fishing? You know, uh, in Madison Lake. Okay. Yep, they'll be on Madison. I've got uh, I got I've got notes for that. Um, we're gonna gonna continue the the theme here that has been winter kill. Waterville did get uh, a fair amount of lakes with some winter kill. My opener options one A and one B are not viable walleye fisheries anymore. That would be Lake Elysian and Eagle Lake, which have been really really good fishing the last couple of years um elysian especially eagle lake was just starting to come on i know there was going to be a lot of folks uh planning on hitting both of those lakes uh, i would look elsewhere uh for walleyes if you like crowds head to madison that's going to be your spot there it's, it's going to be it's going to be a zoo there's going to be a lot of action at madison madison's typically a good spot on opening day it's got good fishing for walleyes and pike and bass and panfish um 
but it is going to be busy. So keep that in mind if you're if you're planning on hitting Madison. Um, some if you if you'd like to avoid the crowds, um, I can give you some other options. Anything connected to the Cannon River is probably a good bet. Uh, from Saber Lake down to Gorman, Tatanka, Upper and Lower Sakata, and then Cannon Lake. We've had a lot of natural reproduction in the uh, in those Cannon River lakes in the last few years. So those are all going to be good bets. They all look fantastic. We can't compete with 38 fish per gill net, but I don't even think a place like Upper Red can compete with 38 fish per gill net, frankly. Um, so those, those are some spots. There's a couple, you know, if you're down in the Albert Lee area, you're looking good at Fountain and Albert Lee. Great numbers in both of those lakes. Uh, Clear Lake and Wasika, maybe not a lake that people think of as Walleye Lake, but we also have excellent numbers there. Uh, so that yeah, some of the I would avoid some of the smaller walleye rearing ponds that we you know that are that we have um, that we stock walleye in Mills. Uh, Mills is probably okay. Henry, with a uh, um, eagle again. If those were on your on your list, I would I would look elsewhere to something deeper and more stable. But anything connected to the Cannon River is probably going to be a good bet. Okay, and the Minnesota River is in part, or at least part of it is in your. Yes, the Minnesota too. River. I haven't driven by lately. I don't know how high it is. It was it was really oh, high okay. early in the spring. Um, keep it as an option, but but check it out. There may be you know I don't think ramps are flooded, but there's going to be a lot of current. There's going to be a lot of debris yeah. most likely. So play it safe with the river. Yes, good good point. Well, um, thank you all, all for those updates, and we're going to go around again and just um, talk about what kind of tips and techniques you might be using for walleye and what you'd recommend. Um, and then if folks, again, reminder, if you have specific questions about some of these things and especially that some of the tips and things, or you want to talk to a fisheries manager, here's your chance, put a, put your question in the Q and A and we'll, we'll get to the ones we can. So Scott, what do you, where are you going to be, or what are you going to be using and what are you going to, how are you going to be attacking fishing this weekend? All right. Well, I'm going to throw a, a, just a little weather tip at you. Um, you know, to answer your question, Jeff, I'm going to be out with a, a jigging minnow bouncing around looking for some of my walleyes. Uh, but when I look at the forecast for the Hutchinson area, it's not good for fair weather anglers, but it sure is good for walleyes. Uh, we're going to have overcast skies on Saturday. Uh, we're going to have cloud cover throughout the day. The wind's going to be anywhere from 12 to 16 miles an hour from the east. So we're going to have a nice walleye chop on the lake, and we're expecting about a third of an inch of rain. Uh, so it sound, looks like it's going to be a, a kind of a steady precipitation pattern throughout the day. You really couldn't choose better walleye angling conditions. They're low light sensitive. Um, they're post spawn, so they're going to probably be co collecting along the first break line or the first sort of transition point where your depths start to change. They're hanging out there post spawn, um, having wrapped up some of our field work uh, with more to come, of course, but uh, some of that walleye spring field work, you know, the, the walleye activity, spawning activity really uh, ended the last few days of April. Uh, you know, it's different throughout the state, but that means those fish will have had really almost two weeks to kind of chill out. Water temperatures are shooting back up, but those conditions are ideal with wind coming from the east. Get yourself over on the western portion where the wind is blowing into work over those uh, depth areas see if you can find an emerging vegetation and uh, edges now that our water temperatures are creeping up and plants will start growing we've got water temperatures that are going to be jumping over 60 fahrenheit uh, in the hutchinson area and again looks like weather conditions are really going to be ideal so we're expecting a pretty nice opener and uh, working those wind blown points and shorelines should work well for folks great good tip uh, BJ, how about in Ortonville? Yeah, I think um, we're probably a little cooler than, than Scott is in Hutchinson, but I would say our water temps are probably going to be in the 50s somewhere. Uh, walleyes are probably post spawn. Um, and kind of Tim was mentioning the different types of lakes in his area, and we have we have that too. Um, if you've seen Big Stone in the last 10 years, you've you've probably noticed the, the difference there, the change in habitat, a lot more vegetation. There's curly leaf pineweed out there now, which it starts growing early. It's it's um, and it probably doesn't really start to die back until sometime in June. And that really has changed the way people fish out on Big Stone. Um, you kind of find got to find those gaps in the in the vegetation. Um, real close to shore, you can find um, um, or there's not as much vegetation and and um, on the inside inside weed lines. Um, or you can fish over top. Of the vegetation too, but on Big Stone, that's 
that's kind of what you're probably going to be dealing with. Um, although I have heard it's not quite as hot, there's not as much curly leaf pondweed this year, or at least it's uh, uh, with this, uh, it's one benefit of the, the hard winter is it didn't get a chance to grow, um, not as much light penetration. So um, hopefully there'll be less of an issue this year as it has been in the previous years. Um, but and I know the, the bite tends to change on big stone too, you know, maybe jig and minnow is pretty, pretty good um, way of fishing, but um, once it warms up, people start a little more trolling and, and, and pulling those spinners too. Um, you know, on Lake Travers, um, there's, you know, there's not near as much vegetation out there. It's more of a windswept, you know, shallow rocky lake. So a lot of people target the, the, uh, the, some of the depth contours, but um, the edge of the rocks or the rock piles, you know, jig and minnow, I like to use a slip bobber. And uh, that's one thing on the border waters too. If you're fishing Big Stone, Hendricks, or Travers, you can have two lines in the okay. uh, open water. So throw a jig in a minnow and throw a slip bobber out there, uh, double up on that. But um, what, what bait are you using on your slip bobber? Use all uh, leeches if they're available. Otherwise, bigger minnows. Um, but I want to mention too that you know that maybe some some of the other guys are going to talk about it too. But there's lots of good fishing besides. Walleyes too. I mean, all these lakes that I've mentioned have great other species. Um, Big stone is bass and bluegill and crappie. Um, Lack of pearl is a tremendous crappie fishery. Um, Travers has has great smallmouth. Um, so yeah, if if walleye is not working out, um, you know this this weekend in the spring, don't be afraid to try something new because there's there's a lot of great fishing to be had. So. Thank you. And we changed uh, this, the DNR changed some of the rules on bass fishing a few years back. And you're just going to go over what the, that's opening this weekend, right? For catch and release? Yeah, catch and release. Um, yeah, starting with the opener, right? So um, I'm so used to dealing with our, our major fishers of the border waters and, and, and they don't close now. So <laughs> yeah, a little different there. Yeah, we get bass then, anglers coming out as soon as the, the ice goes out. So. But on our inner lakes, uh, you it's uh, open. The catch and release opens this weekend for bass fishing. Yeah. Uh, except in the very northern part of the state, there's a small section where you can keep fish, right? Starting this weekend, but for the rest of the state, it's Memorial Day weekend that you can keep bass. But um, lots of great opportunities for bass fishing right now. Um, so next, we're going to go uh, back over to Tim and Spicer. And Tim. Um, we also had a question Angie asked about Northern Lakes, which you mentioned you have many lakes that act like Northern Lakes, but she was specifically asking about Otter Tail County. Uh, I'm not familiar with Otter Tail County. I'm gonna imagine the water temps are gonna be pretty cold up there still. Mm -hmm. I know some of the big lakes have had ice on them until just the last week or so. Um, so this is uh, definitely gonna be changed what you wanna do up there in the, and the, uh, some of our deep lakes are gonna act similar. Um, yeah, so you want to look at those small, smaller, shallower lakes, unless they had uh, winter kills we were talking about. But right, um, but that doesn't say you're not going to be able to catch some fish on some of those deeper lakes. Um, Cronus and Rice, like I mentioned, are some of our little bit deeper lakes that generally put out some fish on on the opening weekend, and most of that people are going to be using some sort of live bait, jigging a minnow, uh, pulling live bait rigs. Uh, leeches, stuff like that. Um, personally, um, some of my favorite opening weekend techniques are going to be a, a bobber and a leech, like BJ mentioned, and either targeting those weed edges or those windblown points. Um, also, you can throw some uh, jerkbait style crankbaits. Um, and those, the great thing about that type of fishing is bass, pike, everything's going to eat, eat a jerkbait. Um, Otherwise, uh, jigging a minnow is always a great, great technique around here too. Um, if you're going out some of them low light conditions, um, even after dark, uh, slow trolling the shallow diving crankbait uh, seems to be a, a pretty, pretty good technique this time of year as well. So. Yeah, Scott touched on I think you know the biology of, of of walleyes and their you know sensitive eyes, and so that applies for nighttime fishing too, right? Absolutely. Yep. Some of the best, some of the best walleye fishing is, you know, right at dawn and dusk and after dark even. So, mm -hmm. great. Okay, um, let's go back to uh, Wyndham, Ryan. Yeah. So, um, 
I don't claim to be a professional angler by any means, but certainly we observe anglers and what they typically do in our area. And, and, and of course we get reports from anglers, but um, you know, what the typical in our area is because um, our lakes are not, are, they're more of the depressional type lakes. They don't have a lot of structure associated with a lot of our lakes because they're just, you know, glacier lakes. And so, or uh, yeah, receded glaciers. And so there's not a lot of rock piles or a lot of breaks, so to speak, you know. So honestly, a lot of our anglers are just trolling shallow running crack baits and, and really looking for, you know, the aggressive fish. Um, and, and that's a lot of times what they'll do is they'll just target those areas. Now, as as far as water temps down here in the banana belt, I always say down here in southern Minnesota, where we are watering our palm trees already, um, uh, things are heating up in a hurry. Uh, we're probably in upper 60 degree water temps already, at least at the surface. Um, we've been stocking fry lately here and uh, yesterday at 66 degree water temps. So it's it's warming up quickly down here, which will theoretically help for the bite. Um, yeah, the typical dawn and dusk bite is is most of the time what our anglers are are targeting. Um, one of the things I think that uh, anglers or maybe novice anglers don't think about is you know when you I was mentioning we're windy down here, and of course nobody likes to sit and get pounded by waves in the windward side, but the reality is is that that's a lot of times where that those are the spots where those wallies are at. So targeting those windblown shorelines are sometimes, if you want to catch fish, where you need to be at times. Um, and so, yeah, don't discount uh, a little bit of uncomfortableness in an effort to try and catch a few walleyes. Uh, so, yeah, I you know, uh, as far as weather patterns, too, um, because our lakes are, are kind of shallower, um, even the day that you're fishing, paying attention to the previous days of wind action is important. Um, you know, if you've had consistent wave action in that particular shoreline, that would be the first spot to start, you know, trolling your crankbaits or, or targeting with throwing jigs up into the rocks. Um, and, and yeah, even slip bobbers um, work too in our area. So um, just little tidbits about keeping an eye on the weather and the weather pattern and and um, that might influence where you're targeting in terms of walleyes. Yeah, and you mentioned um, shore fishing and when you have those windy days, depending on, of course, the wind's coming in, but there's some really great spots. I grew up in Faribault County, actually. There's some lakes with good shore fishing and you can do really well from shore when you, it's harder to manage a boat. So that's a good option to consider. Yeah, there's always that funny saying that uh, you know the angler that is that is in the boat is casting into shore, and of yeah. course the angler that's fishing from shore is casting out towards the boat. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, and Brandon, how about uh, what what techniques are you you going to be using, or any new tips here? Well, if you've been watching the news or paying attention, you probably heard that we're we're looking at a potential bait shortage minnows have been hard to come by i know we buy minnows for the for the hatchery to feed the fish and and we don't we're not we're not getting uh, any bites so to speak from the bait dealers so odds are in your tackle box you probably already got something that's meant to not to be fished plain without bait you don't you don't have to rely on bait you know you, you probably got something that looks like this a bucktail jig or a marabou jig those are those are designed to be fished bare no bait necessary or maybe something like this a jig and a plastic boot tail no bait necessary the plastic is going to do all the work for you um and there's some advantages to these types of to these jigs that can be worked without bait you can move them faster you can fish more aggressive you're picking off the aggressive fish you're covering more ground um if you're fishing a weed edge you can rip you know you can rip a you can rip a bucktail like this right through those weeds. Whereas if you got caught up in the weeds and you got a jig in a minnow, you snap that jig and you're back in the bait bucket, you got cold fingers. Not not so with the bucktail. So if if you're having trouble finding bait, don't worry about it. 
Think of it as a, 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 a reason or excuse to learn something new, potentially try some new techniques. Um, I think you'll find that uh, the bait, while nice, maybe not necessary. Uh, a couple of guys already mentioned classic pattern. I've been told by walleye anglers, there's never a bad time to run crankbaits for walleyes. And this, you know, a shallow diving crankbait is a classic Midwest technique wherever you go, uh, daytime, nighttime, but you can run those things uh, over the tops of the weeds, especially early in the spring and, uh, and pick off walleyes at night, in the morning, during the day, it doesn't matter. Um, if you're a jig fisherman, you got some options too. If you want to fish really fast, don't forget tungsten. We got options uh, that are lead free. It's great. It's great to great to have. Uh, I have one one tip for shore anglers, and this seems to be uh, universal wherever you go to. Is uh, springtime if you can find flowing water, that's kind of the great equalizer, especially for for shore anglers. And we have flowing water in the Waterville area. We've got. A lot of rain the past week or two so so the tiles are running the creeks are running the ditches are running just about anywhere you find flowing water you're going to find uh prey fish congregated and that's going to bring in the fish with teeth that we're all looking for this weekend so so try some try some new stuff no bait you know try some artificial some hair jigs look for flowing water um i, I think you'll have pretty good success um i forgot to mention earlier We've got, if you're looking for some other stuff in the Waterville area, if you're down for the governor's opener, we've got this uh, outlook that we put together every year. It breaks down all the lakes that we've sampled in the last three years by species and by size. Uh, Benji put a link to it uh, earlier. It's a great resource. Um, if you're at the open house tomorrow, we'll have some printed out, pick them up. We'll give you some options, uh, maybe some overlooked lakes for whatever your favorite species is. Great, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned current or flowing water. Um, walleyes in particular seem to really relate to that. You want to, I mean, you mentioned some of the bait stuff, but what walleyes are, they're, uh, they're evolved as a river fish, right? Yeah, yeah, they really have. They're, they, um, a lot of your spawning fish are going to run up rivers. Most of our big walleye egg takes in the state revolve around rivers, uh, not Lake Sarah, but they've got so many fish, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, but that that flowing water draws them in the spring there's there's warmer water in there there's food in there it's just it's a cue for for the walleyes that hey it's time to spawn or hey, we can and then once you're done post spawn then then they're recovering and and feeding heavily um you know gearing up for summer so flowing water attracts attracts walleyes just about wherever you are especially early in the spring but into the summer too, I, 4th of July weekend, I caught a couple of really nice walleyes up in the Alexandria area between lakes in the, uh, you know, fast flowing culvert area. So they, they just relate to that current a lot. So uh, we did have a question and I don't know if this is brand, Brandon, but the, any of you have some report or hear what's going on with uh, Mississippi, especially down around Lake Pepin? So I'll I'll just jump in to say um, your best bet there is to contact the Lake City Fisheries Office. Uh, they they manage Lake Pepin and it's one of Minnesota's uh, 10 large walleye lakes uh, and they do regular assessments out there. I know just from talking to some of their staff through the years, they've just seen uh, exceptional catches on walleye and sauger. I would expect that still be to be the case. I know earlier we were talking about the Minnesota River and fishing prospects. A few folks have commented about high water and flooding situations that, you know, it's receded a little bit. The same mm -hmm. concept is in place with the Mississippi, you know, really taking safety into account with high water, where you're navigating, what navigational hazards, wood and other materials might be floating downstream. But that being said, if you can safely operate, uh, there will be fish to be had down there. And I'm sure uh, Lake City would tell you they were expecting a good fishing opener. Uh, I've fished it a few times and yeah, you might want to wait a few weeks and it is actually, I think it's better towards the end of May and early June, um, especially like on the north end of Lake Pepin, the fish kind of seem to be, you know, coming from their spawning areas down through the river and, and kind of stock, you know, stacked up there by the, 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 the head of the, of Lake Pepin. So, but it's a great place and there's great diversity of uh, habitat with rocks and everything else and, and uh, um, drop offs and stuff in that lake. It's a really great spot to go. I'm looking at the uh, USGS gauge station at Winona and it has dropped quite a bit. It's down to uh, just under 12 feet 
as of May 10th, which is today. On May 6th, it was at 13 and a half feet, so 13 and three quarters. So it's it's come down quite a bit, dropping and dropping fast. Yeah, thank you. Kim mentioned uh, or asked, is there someone we can contact for more info, info on the lakes in the Otter Tail Perm area? Um, and she appreciated all the information. She said that was great, great information. But uh, is Fergus Falls, I think, covers a good amount of that, that area, right? So it'd be the Fergus Falls area office. Detroit Lakes, maybe, too. Closer to Perm, yeah, possibly. Okay, um, yeah, folks, we have time for uh, a few more questions. So if anyone has any other things they're dying to ask some of our fisheries experts, this is a great opportunity to, to ask it. Um, do you guys have any other things you wanna add or tips or techniques or anything? I guess I, I'd encourage anglers that are gonna be targeting the Wyndham area uh to look at our area website i kind of just shared that with uh, benji to put a link in there but basically we have um, each summer you do surveys and uh we populate a graph on our website that basically is the last four years by species that are typically targeted by our anglers and it kind of breaks it down on the, the, the numbers of fish as well as the sizes of fish or whether it be crappie, perch, walleye, northerns. And uh, it would be a good guide um, for those anglers depending on where they're coming from or where they want to go to in our area at least. Do one of you want to talk a little bit more about Lake Finder and how you use that in the reports that are put up there and how people can access them? That's a great resource. I think we've got it listed. Go ahead, Scott. Sure. Uh, so I know Benji has also shared a link. Um, all the area offices around the state for DNR Fisheries have area web pages. We try to get content uploaded in a timely fashion. I know yesterday we completed a, a winter kill sort of synopsis for 2022-2023 with what we found to date. Uh, we also put out these fishing opener previews, which are uh, put together uh, for all the different areas and, and, and appended and uh, Benji put the link in for that as well. Yeah, on the Lake Finder, another great resource for people to use. It gets linked up uh, through our mapping program so you can actually look at our recreational compass and click on different lakes, click on the links for Lake Finder. When you're pulling that up, it's, it's really the, the envy of surrounding states and provinces. It's your one-stop shopping uh, for finding out information about lakes, public water accesses, water clarity, stocking records, where the public accesses are, and the in a, in a pretty fair history of sampling on that lake. You can actually toggle down through different years and look at uh, uh, our standardized gill nets and trap nets and even other sampling gears, what sort of fish we've caught. So it's a great way to scout out lakes to kind of see how the fish populations are looking at that time. There's caveats that apply to that. You know, those, those surveys are a snapshot in time. Uh, one week, uh, uh, the lake, po the fish population may look like that, and and a year, in our lakes in southern Minnesota, in one to two years, it could look completely different. But it is, it is timely. It is, uh, it's worth taking a look at and and kind of scouting around. You learn a lot about uh, what those lakes are known for. Take the time to scroll to the bottom of the page, not just to look at the catch per unit effort or or the index, how many fish per net. Uh, look at the length, frequency histogram you know boxing up and 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 binning all the different sizes of fish so you can kind of see what the size distribution looks like and then drop all the way down to the bottom and read the status of the fishery report that's the public facing uh write-up or summary that our our biologists our managers are putting together and putting out there so it's it's really the the cliff notes of what you need to know about the lake and the individual fish species that are managed, what, what's being observed, what an angler might expect, other information that's really useful. So what a, what a great resource for folks to hit ahead of the opener just to scout around and learn a little bit more about their lake. Yeah, that's great information. You, uh, a couple of you talked about 40 walleyes per net, I think, right? And what, how is that, what's like, what's an average for a walleye lake for take? And so is that like, how much more is that? Or what's, how does that relatively compare? I'll, I'll take a shot at that one. Uh, so 
each in Minnesota we have different lake classifications. So um, some of the shallow lakes in our area might be class 43 lakes, meaning uh, and essentially it's looking at your mean depth, uh, some of your total alkalinity readings, uh, the size of the lake. So it just depends on the type of lake, um, you know, that, that you're dealing with. And certainly Tim's lakes up in Spicer area is much deeper than you'd find in the Wyndham area. And so um, you might have lots of variation between the two. Um, and, and so, yeah, 30, 40, 50 walleyes per gallon is beyond normal and should not be expected as the norm going forward. Um, it just is one of those outlier scenarios that, hey, there's a good population, a good year class that either natural reproduction or good stocking that a lot of those fry took and are successfully swimming around the lake and it they have recruited essentially to the fish community. Uh, but again, um, it, when you talk about uh, say the Wyndham lakes that doesn't have a lot of structure and it's theoretically, you just have a bunch of sw fish swimming around in a circle versus uh, Tim's lakes where they might have structure and they're keying in on certain types of habitat. There's a catchability issue too with our surveys in our lakes, uh, again, depending on the type of a lake. So I, I think the, the safe thing to say is when you're talking about 30, 40, 50 wallies per gallon, you got a good population, you have a good year class recruited and enjoy your fishing, but don't expect it to last forever. Um, and, and so that's what it means to me, essentially. Yeah, and I, I lived for quite a while, my family, on a one of those deep clear water northern lakes that had a huge Cisco tulby population or a very healthy one. And those walleyes would get caught in the nets as they were suspended over the lake, but we couldn't catch them. Uh, we could not find those walleyes except late springs, early year when the opener was in the, you know, like this situation might be a great time because they came up shallow to spawn and they were still relating to some of that structure. So. This could be a great time to go out to some of those lakes. Uh, talk a little bit more. We had a few more minutes, one of you, about uh, kind of your summer work, which I know includes a lot of surveys uh, in lake lake work. But what what kind of things are you doing? And 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 the data that you provide, that you collect, you have a plan. Obviously, there's a process to decide where to go. Does someone want to kind of describe your your summer work and your research or your survey work? Let's hear from one. Uh, let's hear from either Brandon or Tim or or BJ. Don't all jump on at once. Brandon, go for it. Uh, before I start, I was just looking at Lake Finder to compare. You know, give an uh, idea what twenty eight or thirty eight walleyes per gillnet are. Uh, you got a couple classics up in Brainerd Gull and North Long. The last survey. Gull, the classic walleye fishery, had three walleyes per gillnet. Mm -hmm. North Long had 3.9. So okay. think, Those think, numbers are really think, good. think about that when you're trying to decide, should I go to Brainerd or should I go to Wyndham fishing on Saturday? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> uh, summer work, we have a, a list of lakes. I think we manage around 120 lakes in the Waterville area. We don't necessarily survey all of those lakes. A lot of them are shallow. Uh, winter kill lakes and it doesn't do us any good to to survey winter kill lakes we may survey it in the summer and then it kills in the winter and then all our data are are, are you know they're gone it's not worth it but we uh we have we have a list we we have some uh, tiers for lack of a better term of lakes some are more popular lakes or bigger lakes or lakes that get really heavily managed for walleyes get surveyed more often than others we're on a three-year rotation on these tier tier one lakes and a six-year rotation on tier two lakes so that means they get they get surveyed if the lake's coming up in 2023 it'll get surveyed again in 2026 or 2029 if it's a tier two lake um so we have that list and it's the same same group of lakes um if madison gets in 2023 and washington gets surveyed in 2023 then they'll be again in 2026 on the same rotation um it's typically a survey takes us about a week and we set a, a a variety of trap nets and gill nets in in locations across the lake 
and it's the same locations every year. Um, we try to hit it at the same time of year every year, um, just so that everything is is standardized and and comparable. Now, weather plays a factor, and you know, just there's a lot of a lot of variables that we can't control. Um, but that's what we try to control by setting the same nets in the same spot at the same time every year. And we'll do probably a dozen to 15 of those standard surveys that we call them every summer. Um, in addition, we'll have a few targeted surveys which aren't standardized the nets. They don't have the same, uh, the same methods that the standard surveys have. They're, they're a little bit different and we'll do a handful of those. Some of those are just, um, you know, if we get a, a complaint from a lake association they say hey we've been out all summer and we can't find a bluegill nobody can catch a bluegill what happened if we have time we may go out and set a few trap nets and maybe we can come back and say yep you know what we couldn't catch them either we'll we'll, we'll go we'll do something about it um that's the, that's what target surveys we start we start our we, and we start in the spring really with the standard surveys with the bass electrofishing because bass don't get caught in nets and that's going to start probably next week we got water temps in the low low to mid 60s too so good yeah thanks for going over that so i don't know well so when folks run into you at the axis they have a better idea of what you guys might probably are up to out there and and uh and don't don't mess with the nets right don't mess with the nets and watch out yeah. for them don't drive yeah. between the buoys go around yeah yeah Good. Uh, we have one last question. We'll wrap it up. Um, someone was asking about Pelican Lake uh, near Breezy Point, north of Brainerd. Any of you work at the Brainerd office ever recently at all? I didn't think so. That that would be a question for them. They were asking if it's ever been sampled. I would strongly probably suggest yes, it has been. That's a that's a pretty big lake up there. So, but they may just not uh, have that data for some reason not showing up. But reach out to the Brainerd area office. They should be able to help you with that. Well, thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate you joining us today. It's been wonderful to talk about fishing. It's got me really excited to get out this weekend. So, um, and I'll be down in Mankato helping out with the opener. So we're looking forward to being down there. Um, just want to let everybody know who's listening that uh, our next week, we're going to be talking about wildlife and particularly about baby wildlife and orphans and how to, you know, what what, what do you do when you come across um, some wildlife, especially the young spring of the year wildlife. So we'll be talking um, baby wildlife. So we talk about that. And then the following week, we have a really great talk about monarch butterflies and all the great work that's been doing, or been, especially here in Minnesota. We have some organizations, the University of Minnesota also really engaged in that, that program. So check out Come back again, join us, and um, uh, have a great opener. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Thanks. Thanks.